end of Durer. But Durer is also overwhelmingly himself. The picture captures its sitter in near miraculous detail. The painting's inscription is audacious. Written in Latin, it announces that in 1500, Albrecht Durer of Nuremberg painted himself in apt and eternal colors when he was 28 years old. At 28 years old, people were believed to be the most beautiful they will ever become, the most handsome they will ever become. And so Durer represents himself at the ideal moment in his life. Durer didn't call himself the hairy bearded painter for nothing. Hair abounds in this picture. It's not only his own hair, his own beard, on which he lavishes such pictorial as well as cosmetic attention. It's also the fur which creeps out at all corners of the picture and particularly comes forward in that little tuft between his fingers. This tuft of fur to me is the climax of the picture. Now sure, it might be accidental. He just leans his hand against his elegant fur collar. But that very fact of something being accidental in a painting that's supposed to be absolute is what's so fascinating about it. And there's another possibility that I think the painter wants you to feel. That is, that he is touching the world that he belongs to, that he's actually thinking about what his finger feels. And the moment we think that, the moment we suddenly see Durer not looking out at us, but feeling himself, the picture reverses itself. Suddenly, instead of looking out at us, his gaze becomes blank. His gaze becomes an inward turn stare. And that's, I think, one of the great things about the painting. The painting is simultaneously directed outwards towards us, Durer looking out at the world, looking out at us, and at the same time, it's a painting which constantly turns inward, into the self, into the mystery of his own body. Nowhere in the history of art, I think, does a painting behave like a person as much as this picture does. Addressing us, but seemingly absorbed in itself, it is the ultimate self-portrait. What kind of a man would think of making such a thing, a self-portrait in the guise of Christ, a painting disguised as a miracle? To understand what it was like to be Albrecht Dürer, we have to return to his native city. Dürer was born here in the parish of St. Sebald in Nuremberg on the 21st of May, 1471. Out of 18 brothers and sisters, Albrecht was only one of three to survive until adulthood. This wasn't unusual in the time. Child mortality rates were enormously high, and especially in busy trade cities like Nuremberg, where epidemics were frequent. But city life also had advantages. Nuremberg was the preeminent center of German craft and industry. Today, the city recalls this past in the Handwerkerhof. 500 years ago, metalwork dominated. Tools and precision instruments were fashioned here. Dürer's etching of a cannon, as well as his watercolor of a wire drawing mill, confirm this local industry. Nuremberg also had the first paper mill in Germany, which was crucial to the rise of printing in Europe and led to the city becoming a center of book production. Albrecht Dürer was born here in 1471. Nuremberg was a commercial hub of Europe and free of the many regulations that burdened other cities. Albrecht's parents placed their hopes on him, their eldest son, and from a very young age, he showed exceptional talent and discipline. My father took special pleasure in me because he saw that I was diligent in striving to learn. So he sent me to school, and when I had learned to read and write, he took me away from it and taught me the goldsmith's craft. Dürer's father was a goldsmith by trade. As such, he would have ranked among the most esteemed craftsmen of the day. Vital to Nuremberg's economy, goldsmiths couldn't leave the city without permission because of the trade secrets they might divulge. Their work required care, neatness, and confidence in working precious gold. Drawing was central to the goldsmith's craft. 
Products had to be designed before they were executed, and finished works were detailed with beautiful lines. By his early teens, the young Dürer had mastered the sure but delicate lines needed both for working in gold and for drawing accurate designs. This was an amazingly precocious talent for one so young. Life drawing is hard to do. Drawing yourself is even harder. These 13-year-olds here in Nuremberg are trying to draw themselves from a mirror. Every time they draw, of course, they move because they're drawing. They have to sit still for themselves. Dürer's earliest surviving work is an astonishing self-portrait done at the age of only 13. Here he's working with silver point, in which the line can't be erased once it's made. That's incredibly hard to do. Long after he produced the self-portrait, he included an inscription which explains proudly what he'd done. This I drew after myself from a mirror in the year 1484, when I was still a boy. The mature Dürer assumed that posterity would want to know not only what he, now a great artist, looked like as a child, but also how well he could draw. This is the earliest child's drawing we possess in the history of art. And it's the only example I know in which Opus 1 is a self-portrait. At 13, Dürer was still apprenticed to his goldsmith father and had no training in art. The drawing thus displayed natural gifts, what Dürer termed genius and lauded as the God-given source of artistic greatness. I was inclined more to painting than to goldsmith's work. So I put it to my father, but he was troubled, for he regretted the time lost while I had been learning to be a goldsmith. Still, he let me have my way, and in 1486, my father bound me as apprentice to Michael Wolgemuth. As a painter, Wolgemuth wasn't particularly gifted, but his workshop was by far the largest in Nuremberg, and it was about to undertake one of the biggest and most innovative artistic projects of the time, and Dürer would experience it firsthand. Through Wolgemuth, Dürer witnessed one of the great publishing projects of the age, the so-called Nuremberg Chronicles. To call this book ambitious is an understatement. It tells the whole story of the world from the creation all the way down to the book's production, 1493. It's a hand-colored version. Dürer would have participated in the early stages of production. Thus, he would have witnessed one of the most significant commercial and creative ventures of the era, a successful painter, Wolgemuth, collaborating with a writer and publisher to produce a costly printed book. He would also have been struck by what the Nuremberg Chronicles gathered between its covers, namely copious information about the world. This would have fed two of Dürer's lifelong passions, the instinct to collect and an unquenchable intellectual curiosity about the world around him. By the end of his apprenticeship, Dürer was hugely ambitious. His was an expanding image of the world. In the same year as Columbus reached America, Nuremberg's artists and cartographers invented new ways of picturing an emerging world. In 1490, Dürer left Nuremberg on travels that would take him through northern Europe. Young artists typically spent time as journeymen, so Dürer sought out the cutting-edge masters of the era. His first stop was the workshop of Martin Schongauer. But by the time he arrived, Schongauer was dead. Schongauer had represented the gold standard of German art. His style informed Dürer's development at every level, from composition and subject down to the system of shading or hatching used to render shadows. A goldsmith's son like Dürer, Schongauer had also been a pioneer printmaker. He was just the man for Dürer to imitate, then easily surpassed. Some of Dürer's drawings from his journeyman years are preserved in the British Museum print room. This is one of Dürer's early study sheets. 
can learn just about everything about Dürer's early practice by looking at a drawing like this. You see, he's drawn on both sides using every bit of paper. You see, he starts off with a traditional subject of a virgin and child, uh, and particularly interested in the complicated way drapery is folded and crumpled. And he gets a little trouble here, where the um, arm of the Virgin is supporting the Christ child. And he tries out that gesture up here in a separate sketch of the Virgin's arm. He seems to get more interested then in the question of hand gestures. And this is a telling moment. In the upper right, he begins to practice using his own hand as a model to make a new gesture. You can clearly see the way Dürer's body circulates through his work. Through drawing everything he sees, and through seeking everywhere the novel, Dürer takes command both of the world and of the graphic means to turn the world into an image. Later, Dürer would advise young artists to draw diligently so as to acquire a hand practiced to almost perfect freedom. Virtually every surviving line by Dürer demonstrates this freedom. Wherever it travels, his quill leaves its mark effortlessly on the page, remaining true to the object and beautiful in itself. Dürer's travels lasted for four years, an unusually long time to be a journeyman. Clearly relishing his freedom, Dürer had learned important lessons about telling stories with pictures, about the economics of art. But returning to Nuremberg, Dürer confronted his most important business deal to date, his marriage. And when I returned home, Hans Frey made a deal with my father and gave me his daughter, Miss Agnes by name, and with her he gave me 200 florins. 200 florins was a small fortune in 1494. Eventually, Dürer and his wife Agnes would buy this house where they lived and worked. Today, it's a museum where a latter-day Agnes welcomes guests with stories of her husband. When I was 18, my father came to me one day to say that he had chosen the man I was to marry, Albrecht Dürer. Well, I couldn't remember what he was like at the time because he'd been away for four years from town. So he sent me a picture from Strasbourg, where he was at the time, and I was quite impressed. Dürer probably made his first painted self-portrait to send to Agnes on the eve of their marriage. Painted on vellum, it could be rolled up for easy transport. At the top, Dürer wrote the words, My affairs, they go as ordained from above. Resigning his future to the stars, he holds a prickly thistle, believed to be an aphrodisiac and an emblem of luck in love. Dürer's marriage to Agnes was beneficial to him professionally, as indeed it was intended to be. Her dowry bought him a workshop, and her social standing as a member of Nuremberg's elite bought status and connections. A sketch from the time of their wedding gives a candid glimpse of the bride from the groom's point of view. My Agnes, as he calls her, seems withdrawn and unremarkable, the very antithesis of the exhibitionist husband who draws her. And just two months after our wedding, he was off again to Venice, where he stayed for six months without me. This next trip was crucial. For Dürer, crossing the Alps meant experiencing firsthand great Italian art during its self-proclaimed Renaissance. His journey initiated a new combination of distinctive painterly styles. Dürer was able uniquely to merge two very different traditions, German and Italian. His trip changed everything. The views Dürer painted while traveling chart his route. Journeying by horse and carriage, he approached the Alps via Innsbruck, where he captured the town in a new medium, watercolors. Crossing the mountains through the Bremar Pass, he descended via Arco in Italy towards the outskirts of Venice. Spontaneous but supremely confident, these watercolor views are among the first true landscape paintings in European art. <laughs> 